we're in the book of Philippians on Sunday. We're studying the fruits of the Spirit on Tuesday for our lunch study. And we've been dealing with the first fruit there called love. So if you'd like to come and have lunch with us and study with us, well, come on in. They usually gather around 1130 to eat. And then I come in and teach it from 12 to 1, and then we get you out of there back to work or wherever you have to go. I'm in the book of Philippians now. I'm in verses 15 through 19. Philippians 1, 15 through 19. Uh, when you uh, study Paul's writing, you look for markers, and you can certainly see a great marker uh, in chapter 1 if you counted the number of times the word gospel is used in chapter 1, uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, probably no chapter has mentioned the word gospel as much as Paul did when he wrote back the, to the church at Philippi from Roman prison. And, and if you'll go back, once you count all those things and lay them out, if you'll go back and and see what he said about the gospel is really important. He talks about different aspects of the gospel when it's under ministry. And so that's really important that you might see that. Uh, for example, in our passage in verses, uh, starting with verse 12, uh, Paul said, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have, have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel for the greater progress of the gospel. And then he talks about that in verses 13 and 14. I picked up the subject because not only was he having, uh, uh, was he being attacked, uh, his ministry from outside the church, but he was being attacked from inside the church on the gospel. And so he picks that subject up in uh, verse He's in prison. Look at verse 13. My imprisonment for the cause of Christ has become well known throughout uh, the Roman system, the Praetorian Guard and uh, Caesar's household. And, uh, and uh, the gospel has been going out of the Roman uh, imprisonment uh, and having a great effect. Uh, people were getting saved is the idea. What he tells us in, in 15 through 19, that he was being attacked for preaching a grace gospel by both the outside world and the inside of the church. And he's going to identify this conflict that he's in. In verse 15, most to, to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife and some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So he's used the word gospel again, and this time he's talked about the apologetics. The apologetics. The word defense is where you get the English word apologetics of the gospel. Then he says in verse 17, the former, he talked about the latter group as well as the former group, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. In other words, they're, they're looking to heap it on. What then? Verse 18, in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed and in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. And then he says, for I know, he, this, he has great confidence about this conflict, I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, through prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So Paul Paul talks about the defense of defending the grace gospel and that he's been put in prison and he's being attacked both from inside the church about a grace gospel as well as outside the church. 
there were some inside the church that didn't like the idea of a grace gospel. They, they didn't want a gospel apart from some aspect of the law. Oh, it's okay to believe, but you got you got to be circumcised. You got to be baptized in order to be saved. In other words, they always added something to faith. Faith alone is not enough. Like the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. They wanted to add something of themselves in there. And he was being attacked for preaching a grace without works. He was being attacked from inside as well as outside. Well, he's being attacked from people outside because his gospel was getting people saved and they were leaving pagan religions and lifestyles. So let's have a word of prayer. I know probably you come to church, like many of us, with some burden issues on your soul things going on either in your life or connected to your life that uh, need addressing in prayer. So I'm going to, I'm going to allow us to have a word of prayer and then in, in silence, and I don't want to pray it out loud, but in silence, address some of those issues today. I'm going to give you a moment of silence today to address some of those issues that are bothering some in your life. It could be about your life or connected to your life or your family or, or health issues or whatever they are. I know because I talk to people who, who come to church and they, they've got great burdens. And um, remember that you pray under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Evidence, uh, evidence of carnality, your prayer will not be heard if you're carnal. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. You confess it before you pray. You confess it before you study the Bible so that your prayer is under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Your ministry and prayer has to be addressed properly to the Father in the name of Christ. It has to be prayed according to the will of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit. So you need to be aware of that. So I give you a moment of silence. To, if you need to confess any kind of sin, it could be mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or revert sins, you confess them in silence and privacy so the Holy Spirit can minister the truth of the Word of God. So let us pray. And in this, I'm going to give you a, a, a period of silence for you to deal with some of the things that are, I suppose, top of the list in your life. Well, Father, you've heard our prayers. We are confident that if we prayed according to the will of God, according to what John wrote in the fifth, in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, that if we pray anything according to your will, in, of course, in the, in, in the proper, proper motive in the spirit, according to your will, you will hear us and you will answer that prayer. We do know that it will be answered in your timing and not ours, according to Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3. But we are confident that our prayers will be heard and our, our prayers will be answered according to the will of God. So we offer those to you today, Father, and, and look to see those prayers answered in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's take a look at this passage. Let me try to show you some things. First of all, Paul is in Roman prison. He's in Roman prison. All right? It's important you know that. This is called Paul's first Roman imprisonment. Don't confuse this with Paul's second. To He writes the book of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. In those books, confident, Paul is confident, like he is in our book, Philippians, that he will be released from the Roman imprisonment. He's confident of that. When Paul is put in the second Roman imprisonment, he writes 2 Timothy 
it's important you know this. He writes 2 Timothy, and he is confident that he will not leave prison, that he will die. So you really need to know when you when Paul talks about I'm imprisoned and the, yada yada what you're talking about. All right. So this is really important. His first imprisonment, his first imprisonment is the one that he's talking about in Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And he is confident in all these books that he will be released. And the, the Philippians, he says, I look, I'm I'm joyous about this thing. I'm going to be released. There. They're going to, I'm in Rome to have the Romans as a citizen. He was a dual citizen. I'm in Rome because I've appealed to Caesar to hear my case. And he is confident that he'll be released when Caesar hears it because it is the Jews that want to try to kill him. <laughs> they want to kill one of their own because the owner is speaking the truth to them. So. But you really want to keep these, these writings clear in your mind. Because when he writes 2 Timothy, he's not coming out. He's confident he's not going to come out of this. That Rome will kill him this time, and Rome did under Nero. They, they, will, they will behead him. And he is confident. He knows in his soul, this is, this is going to be the end of my ministry right here in the second imprisonment. It's well worth your read. Second Timothy would be well worth your read to see how he feels about his life and ministry. Still, he's very positive, but he's confident he's not going to come out. Well, I give you that background because it's important because a lot of people read the Bible and they don't study it. So I'm talking about how you, what you should learn when you read the Bible through a proper study. All right? So here he is. He's in his first imprisonment. He's in Rome because he's appealed. Now, they've, they've tried him in all kinds of courts. They've, the Jewish courts have tried him, the Roman courts, out, out in the districts, out in the provinces. Paul has appealed to have the case in a Roman court. And so they put him, put him on a, a prison ship and sent him to Rome. Oh, well, I can't give you everything in one hour today, so I, you know, to give it. If you come and stay with me, if you come and stay with me a year, I'll, I'll give you enough information that all this stuff will make sense to you. But <clears throat> now, in his first imprisonment, he's under house arrest. He's under house arrest. He he he. They have they have put him in a because of his Roman citizenship and because their Rome is not clear on what the charges are. They treat him as a freed subject ready for trial. And so they put him in a house arrest in Rome. They, with, they put him under house arrest. And so people are able to come and go while Paul is in what he's called imprisonment. He's waiting Roman trial as a freed citizen arrested and a hear, hearing needs to be heard. He, he deserves a hearing and he's waiting for that. And so you can read about that. I write some pat. If I write passages on your paper, you're supposed to do what? Thank you. So I wrote these down because I don't have time to, to look at all these, but I put them on your paper for they're interesting read for you on what I'm commenting. Listen, I teach apologetics. I don't know if you know that, but I teach apologetics. I always defend whatever I'm teaching by the word of God. I don't give you what I think. I tell you what it says. And I give you scripture. If you know anything about me, you know I'm an ap apologetic, Christian apologetics. It's just simple. And this word defense, when Paul says, I'm in prison because of defending the gospel, the word is apologetics. The Greek word is, ap the, the whole concept of apologetics is Greek. It's, it's, the, it's the Greek system of debate. And so Paul uses that. I do that because in Christianity, apologetics is a key method of teaching. 
We've lost it because nobody pays attention to the Word of God anymore. We've lost that idea. Apologetics is defending a categorical doctrine, whatever that is, whether it's the gospel or eternal security or whatever it is. It's defending it on the scriptures. It's defending the scripture. What does the scripture, what does the Bible say about it? That's all called apologetics, Christian's apologetics. It used to be the only system of teaching. Jesus taught apologetics. Paul taught apologetics. Peter taught it. John taught it. They all taught it. Well, uh, so he's in, under house arrest. And in today's text lesson, Paul is sharing with the Philippian church how important their prayers, how important their prayers have been for him in his imprisonment. He is so thankful for their prayers. I can tell you that the people that we have overseas in ministry, foreign missions, our foreign missionaries who live, residents over there, as well as the ones we send, really need our prayers. They're having great ministries overseas. Uh, the Myers in Ukraine are having a phenomenal ministry amidst warfare. Uh, you should pray for the Myers every day of your life. They're just in the, me the, the middle of it and having great ministry and, and, and just funerals every day. The Myers, we, they're, they're part of our team. The, the Morgans, the Molinars, Morgans in the, in, in, uh, the, Phili the, the Philippines, and uh, the Molinars in South Africa, the Myers in Ukraine. I mean... Please start your day with them on your heart because their day is tough. Uh, and uh, can you imagine moving your entire family to a foreign culture with a foreign language and all of that stuff? Uh, I mean, it's hard for some of us probably to just get along with what we got in America. Well, well anyhow, Paul is sharing with the Philippian church how important their prayers are for him since he's fighting a war inside the church as well as outside the church. Paul was placed under house arrest for preaching the gospel of salvation. If you want to know what we mean by that, you can read 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 1, 16, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It is the gospel. Paul wrote in Philippians 1, 7, It is only right for me to feel this way about you all, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. See that word defense? That's apologetics. He's going out there, he's opening the Bible, and he's teaching right out of the Bible what the Bible says about whatever he's talking about that should change their life. Your life needs to be compatible with the word of God. And he's taking heat from inside the church as well as from outside the church. Look at my imprisonment. He said, it is only right for me to feel this way about you, about your prayers and your provisions for my life, my ministry, since both by my imprisonment, in my defense, and in the confirmation of the gospel, you have been partakers of the grace with me. Write that. See, the word defense is apologetics of scriptures. The affirmation, the affirmation of it is people getting saved and people's life changing under the power of the Holy Spirit with the Word of God in their life. Listen, I'll tell you how you know if you're growing because you're making choices and decisions based on the Word of God that you've learned. Based on the Word of God that you've learned. And that's important to your life. And so the word, I wrote the Greek word, where we get apologetics from on your paper. In the English, they call it defending the truth. The Greek word defense. It is identified in Philippians 1.16 in our passage 
when Paul calls it the defense. It's normally translated in the Bible that way. I want to talk about four aspects of Paul's apostolic or, or, or apologetic defense for preaching the gospel of salvation apart from the works of the law. He was being criticized inside the church for the works of the law. He was being criticized on the outside because the only way to God was through him, through Christ. And the religions got upset with that like they do today when you say Jesus is the only way, the truth, and life to God. No man can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. They get upset with that. Inside the church, they get upset when you tell them that you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. You can't add anything to it. They get upset. With, well, I think you ought to add something. How will they know? And they said, well, they know because the word of God says so. That's apologetic teaching. That's what we teach around here. That's how we teach it. We give you, we give you evidence of it from the scriptures. We lay scriptures on you. We make a point and lay scripture on you. Uh, we, we know no other way to teach you because, listen, the word takes you to the will and the will takes you to the work of the Lord. There's no other way to do it, in my opinion. So point number one, I've got four points for you today. We will begin with a four-point outline of our lesson text. Here's what I've discovered. I have discovered over my years of teaching that a lot of people read the Bible and they never study it. Even when they get a study Bible, they don't study it. I mean, it ought to tell you if you put your money in a study Bible, and you should. Because it lays out so many things for you to make the study of the Bible simpler. Won't make the reading of it. If all you're going to read it, the Bible, well, you can get a cell phone and that'll work. If you're just going to read it. But look, if you're going to study it, that's a whole different ballgame. It's a whole different ballgame. And people read it, but they don't study it. You look for stuff in the passage, and you're looking for what the writer is telling you. And we teach that way here. That's what we're doing. I'm doing right now with you. I've taken this passage down. I want to show you what Paul is telling you, and I want to break it down so we can mechanically understand how we're to use the Word of God. If you study the Word of God and get the point the writer is saying, you can take and apply it to your life. It'll change your life. It will make your choices compatible with the will of God, and that's a good thing. It's a big deal. So here's what Paul did. Paul broke down his imprisonment. The pressure put on him is now inside the church as well as outside the church. And he's talking about the people inside the church. He's a, in, in, in verse 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, Paul is going to address the war, the conflict that is against him from in, within the church. And, he, and, he, and I, I grouped them, I put them in three groups of conflict. And watch this now. Watch this now. Paul identified two groups in the church in conflict regarding the grace gospel. First of all, he identified them as some. Watch this in verse 15. He said, some... Do you see some in your Bible? All right. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. Some also from goodwill. So he says there's a conflict over the grace gospel in the church. Some are preaching, it, preaching against it out of envy and strife. That's what their preaching is causing. And the others are preaching out of goodwill. In verses 16 and 17, he does something interesting. He identifies these groups as the latter and former. The ones he calls some, he now calls latter and former. In verses 16 and 17, now watch this. When you look at it, I want you to pick up when you study the Bible, you see these things. When you read it, you don't. Listen to what he said. He said the latter, that's the ones doing goodwill, the latter do it out of love. 
knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, those are the ones doing our envy and strife, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motive. Thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. In other words, there are some in the church, instead of supporting Paul's preaching a grace gospel, have chose to heap it on him while he's in prison. Well, let's just heap it on him. Let's, let's, let's just make it worse for him, not better. If he'd stop preaching that grace gospel, he wouldn't be in so much trouble. My, my, my. A warfare outside the church and inside the church, he's in prison, and the church at Philippi, a group has, a, has rose up to take over the church who are a works-oriented salvation people. And they think that they can destroy Paul's ministry. They, they're in hopes of destroying Paul's ministry by a, a, by a, by a insurrection in, uh, the insurrection of Paul's ministry inside the church. That Philippi wouldn't be in existence without Paul going and preaching a grace gospel. There has arose a group within it's going to try to take it over. I don't know if you've been around long enough to see all that stuff, but if you stay long in Christianity, you're going to see this stuff. You preach grace, there's going to be a warfare over it. Now, people... People have a lot of options out here in Moody. They can go most anywhere and hear most anything. You come here, you're going to hear everything about grace. We, we, we talk everything about grace. We talk about grace salvation, grace living, grace suffering, grace growth, grace dying, grace surpassing, grace for eternity. We teach grace. People that come in, they get upset with us because we preach grace all the time. They don't think, they think they're, ha listen, most, most churches out there today, most of them, have a, they give you a grace salvation, then try to take it away with a works program in the Christian life. Oh yeah, you're saved by grace, but boy, you better, you better do a work system or you're going to lose that. That's it. That, it's just, and when you go like, that's not true. That's not true. The Bible don't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach it. People teach the Bible says that. The Bible doesn't say it. If you study it, apologetic, you'll find that's not true. And so these people, they, you know, if they get upset, they, in the South, they just move away and do something else. In Modi, we have, you have a lot of options. There are a lot of churches out here. And uh, you will find one that's comfortable for you. But if you want grace, if you want grace teaching and apologetic teaching, this is what we're about. This is what Jesus, this was the method Jesus used. It was the method the disciples used. Apologetic. I'm going to show it to you today. I always do that. I'm just, I didn't make up something, right? The word apologetics is the word, English word defense, and it's a Greek word, right? Oh, my, my. You know, some people actually believe that the Bible is written in English. You do know it was written in Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. Well, I don't know. Okay, so let's look at it. So Paul, Paul talks about it. He, he, went, he used some, and then he, he put them apart, latter and former. And watch, in verse 18, he's going to do it one more time. He's going to take that same group, and he's going to call one the pretense and the other the truth. Look at this, verse 18. Paul also identified these two groups by their motives. One was pretense and the other truth. Paul said, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth. Here's the bottom line, he said, important. Christ is proclaimed. And for that, I'm thankful. <laughs> Christ is proclaimed. They were all preaching the same gospel message. Listen, the, all these people were preaching the same gospel message 
Jesus came into the world to die for sin, was buried and raised from the dead. They all parted way after that. Some said, well, you've got to believe and be baptized. You've got to believe and be circumcised. You've got to believe and do something in order to be saved. It destroys the grace gospel. Grace gospel is why Jesus came and died. A grace gospel. Christ did all the work so that you could have it as a what? Gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift, not of works. It's a gift. Right? If there's work involved, it's wages. If it's wages, it's not gift. Romans third chapter, Romans the fourth chapter. You should read it if, if you think that different. Paul goes into great detail on that. And so he says, some do by pretense, they preach a gospel that Jesus died, was buried, and raised, and then they depart from the grace idea. They throw the grace out and put some works in. They throw grace out and put works in. That's pretense. Paul says, you don't have it. You don't have it until you understand that salvation is based on what you believe is the source of your salvation. It's 100% the work of Christ and 0% man. Christ did all the work on the cross to your benefit. Later, Paul can say, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the point of grace. So, in verses 18 and 19, Paul says, but, you know, here's the bottom line. They're all preaching a proper message, even though their mechanics are wrong. They're proclaiming Christ. And for that, I am thankful. I am not thankful that they portrayed grace, but I am thankful they haven't portrayed the person of Christ. He came into this world to die for our sins. And for that, I'm forever grateful. But, church, you can't do that, he said. You can, these people have to be told they can't do that. Paul explains how he rejoices in these attacks. <laughs> Paul said, I rejoice. Listen to what Paul says. Christ is proclaimed, and in this, Christ proclaiming, and in this I rejoice, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provisions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful way to look at that. Jesus did that with his disciples. They came back one time and they said, Lord, there's, there's a group down the street and they're, they're preaching Christ and they're, they're not of our group. He said, who are they preaching? And they said, well, they're preaching Christ. What they preach, and he said, they said, well, he, that he's coming, he's doing it, and, and uh, they're identifying the, the Messiah with you. And they said, well, then leave him alone. Then leave him alone. And that interesting? Leave him alone. Let the Lord deal it, work with it. I mean, I don't have any power over these people's life. They're not coming to my Bible studies. They're not listening to me. Why would I listen? If they're preaching the right person, let them go. Right? You know how much that would cost us on 6 o'clock news to get that kind of advertising? No, I don't need it probably to say that stuff. But I probably didn't say that. Point number two. See, I, here's my point. When you, when you take a look at a passage, study it. See, I found all of that in that passage. You would just, well, I don't know. What, what do we care? I'm just trying to read through the Bible and get some credit. Right? Don't do that. Get some knowledge. You read the Bible for knowledge and wisdom. Credit come later. What you have to be confident when you read Philippians, Ephesians, Philemon, uh, you want to be, listen, Paul is confident. Paul is confident that he's going to be released from prison. Not so in 2 Timothy. Not so. Point number two, Jesus taught his followers that they would be, that they would be persecuted Jesus, Jesus taught his followers that they would be persecuted for a grace gospel. Luke 12, and listen, you're going to find our word in there. 
Luke 12, 11 and 12. I wrote it on your paper. And when they bring you before the synagogues, rulers and authorities, he told them, do not become anxious about how or what you should speak in your defense. See the word defense? That's apologetics. And it means to give scriptural evidence of why you believe what you believe. Or, number three, what you should say for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you are ought to say. Isn't that interesting? He said, let me tell you, a declining nation always tries to censor the freedom of speech. And the devil uses it to attack the church. And the devil uses it to attack the gospel of Jesus Christ that is prepared to go to the highway and the hedges to the public square and tell them that Christ came to save their souls. You need to really be aware when a government tries to put censorship on free speech. Our Constitution is the most magnificent Constitution in regard to the biblical principle of freedom of speech. First, they work legally censorship, and then they enforce it to shut you down. And if they can't shut you down, they'll put you in prison. Hello, Paul. Paul has this in Philippians 129. Paul said the same thing Jesus said to the church when he said, it has been granted for, your, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Christ, but to be persecuted for him to suffer for his namesake. Now, why do I tell you this? Listen, we're headed that way. Do you not know that? If our election does not go with the support for the support of our Constitution, we're in deep, serious trouble. Because they're pushing, they're pushing censorship like crazy right now. You do know that, don't you? And they're coming for us. They're, they, did, they did Jesus and they did Paul. They've done it throughout biblical history. They have done this. You need to be praying every day that God would raise up some real statesmen, not politicians. That good, solid farmers would leave their plows and come to the city to help govern us. Because our universities certainly are not producing them. They are not producing these people. They used to produce them. They're not producing them anymore. They're going to have to come from the grunt and the workers. They're going to have to come from blue collar. It's not going to come from white collar. And they're coming for us, people. I'm telling you, they're coming for us. Every once in a while, they'll threaten us. You can't say that. We're going to take you off. And we go like, Pfft. personally for me, I could care less. You could take my cell phone. You could take my television. You could take all this stuff. I started out my life without any of them. I don't care if I had any of that stuff. You could come and for all the toys, you could come and have them. If the government wants my toys, they can have them. You want my speech, you can't. They're after our speech. They're after our vocal cords. And once they get censorship into law, they'll come for us. They'll shut us down. They'll put, they'll put the, the teachers in prison to warn the Congress. If you pay any attention to foreign, the church in foreign countries, 
This is exactly what they do. It's coming to America. The third world country is coming to America. This is what they do with the church in, in third world country. They preach the truth. Either that or they buy them and shut them down. They, in another way, they buy them and put them under their thumb. I'm, I'm, uh, we all know that. Look, I want you to write these, write these passages down. I don't think I put them on you. Well, under point number three, did I put down 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16? I want you to put that down. Put down 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. I wrote these down on my paper this morning. I wrote, we have Luke 12, 11 and 12, where Jesus talks about it. But also write down 21, Luke 21, 10 through 15. Because what we learn is apologetics is the key to the Christian church in defense of the word of God. Apologetics is the way Jesus taught, Paul taught, all the disciples. In fact, the early church, that's the only way they taught was apologetics. They, they would make a statement and then prove it by the word of God. They're always quoting the Old Testament in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then we have the New Covenant, and then Paul does it under the New Covenant, the Old Covenant, and then the New Covenant. The church of Jesus Christ must come back to apologetics, but to do it, the men and the pulpit have got to be men of the Word of God. None of this. I was fishing the other day, and let me tell you a story, and then we go home after a song. That day's got to leave the church of Jesus Christ. We've got to get back to apologetics where doctrine is taught and evidence is given from the word of God of why it's so. So apologetics is a key to the Christian church. It always has been. Paul used it. Jesus used it. I put scripture on your paper. Listen, Paul actually did it in court. He did, just like Jesus he defended what he believed in court. And Paul did the same thing. Both Jesus and Paul used Greek apologetics debate technique for defending the message of the grace gospel of salvation. They did it in the church and they did it outside the church. Very few opponents could beat them in apologetic debate if you want to you read the life of Paul and the life of Christ he was constantly being challenged by those who viewed things differently from the scripture and none of them could beat him none of them could beat because they twisted the scriptures listen the devil always distorts the word of God the devil uses the scriptures and distorts them that's how you know who's who but the devil did it with Adam and Eve in the garden. It distorted the scriptures. Well, you don't really think that's what that means. I don't know what that means. Let me tell you what it really means. And first thing you know, they're both hung up to dry. Very few opponents could beat them in apologetics debate. I promise you that. I have people write me all the time. Well, Ronnie, when you say, and I go like, well, well, lay your argument out doctrinally. Most of them, first of all, they didn't know what you're talking about. Second of all, it's too much work. And third of all, they know they got somebody who's, got, got, who's going to take them into the Word. I don't mind that. You, you think I'm wrong about something? Bring it, bring it on. I don't mind that. I want the truth. That's all I want. I want the truth. You've got to bring your game. You can't come in and think you're going to blow me down because it's you got, you got to have the word of God. You got to have the word of God. As a result, the opponents usually reverted. Watch me. When they can't win an argument from the word of God, here's what the opponents do. They go physical and legally attacking to silence. They go physically and legally to silence you. Should never do that. You shouldn't do that in your marriage. You shouldn't do that in your family. You shouldn't do that in your church. You shouldn't do that. 
You shouldn't do that. I'll tell you, and if you do do it, I did that one time, and I got in serious trouble with the Lord. I got in serious trouble with the Lord. He put me under his thumb, and I was in a serious hurt for several weeks before I could get out from under it. And I go, I don't, why are you doing this to me? What is going on? I said, mm. Mm. Stop whining. I ain't through with you yet. Mm. I'll tell you when you can talk. We're not ready to talk yet. Shouldn't do that, people. You're going to get, you're, you're going to get whacked. You shouldn't do that. Do not do that. Listen, you can settle everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And when you can't do that, you're in the wrong business. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be counseling. You shouldn't be pastoring. You shouldn't do that. You should take a break. Because you do not want the Lord to put his thumb on you. He put it on me. But I didn't do that anymore. I didn't do that anymore. I got your message, sir. (laughs) I have your message. I don't need that anymore. And... hmm. I was in so much pain... As a result, the opponents usually reverted to physical or legal attacks to silence their opponent. It's called censorship of speech. Censorship of the freedom of speech. This is always true in a declining nation. Don't buy in to that. Bully techniques won't work. And eventually, you got to get tired of it and he'll put his thumb on you. Better his thumb than his foot or something else. I don't want I don't want any more from him and his thumb. I can tell you that. I just give you a word of caution. The cosmos diabolicus enemy, which is Satan, always attacks freedom of speech. Always attacks freedom of speech and choice. Always. Always. Always be aware of somebody that wants to shut you down before you've had your say. That tactic, that bully a tactic. I don't care if it's in the pulpit or where it is. Don't go with it. You stand up, have your say. If they're honorable, they'll listen and have discussion. John 8.32 is a great passage, in my opinion, about freedom of speech. And so he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Here's what you miss. Let me tell you what you miss. The simplicity of the key word, the key word is set you free. That's the key. Set you. Set you. The, the word of God, the truth. You shall know the truth. And by knowing the truth, the truth will set you free. Yes, I that. He's talking to people who are free. He's talking to people who are free that need to embrace the truth of the word of God and allow that to set you free from all of your anger and all of your disgust and all of your gripes and complaints about everything. The truth should set you free. And when it's not, you're not in the truth. And people, we've got to be aware of this. We've got to be aware of it. We've got to embrace this for sure. 
Well, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to come back second hour, and I'm going to complete this so that we can move on. Coffee and donuts and things of that nature downstairs. Uh, if you're free on Friday morning, maybe would like to help well, see a Willie or Roger or somebody like that that's involved in that uh, uh, football breakfast. We're going to have prayer. The men will take the offering. Then we'll take a 15-minute break. Father, we're so thankful. For those who have come to study with us, open the word and let the and be open to the word. It's one thing to open the word, it's another thing to be open to it. To allow the Holy Spirit to minister the truth of the word of God. Boy, we're in a the church is in a, a day of ministry in which the light ought to be bright because the nation is in darkness. And the light of the church ought to be just a bright beacon in the valley, not necessarily on the hill, because it is so dark around us. I pray that we would be that light in Moody, in St. Clair County, in, this, in the state of Alabama, Father. I pray that we be that light. It's one thing to have the light, and another is to let it shine. Father, we have the light. Let it shine. May we stop interfering with it and let it shine, shine, shine. Take this offering, Father. Give us stewardship, consciousness of spending as little on ourselves as we can to support the ministries going out of our church into the community, into the county, and beyond our borders, Father, to the uttermost parts of the end. And again, we thank you for those who are willing to go and put a residence on the foreign field, as well as those who are willing to go and support units that are already out there and become combat ready for the, the great hall of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know you're coming, Father. We know you're coming. And uh, we need to prepare the people for the coming of Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been in the book of Philippians in the first chapter, looking at verses 15 through 19. Uh, I was shocked when I read through this book and taught it the first time that uh, Paul was being attacked from within inside the church, this wonderful church, this church is, Paul couldn't say enough good things about it. And uh, as soon as he got in prison, why... Uh, the attack came against him as well from the outside, came from the inside as well. And uh, uh, Paul is now trying to defend himself, um, 
to the congregation, and I thought I thought he did it pretty admirably. The way he described them, he said there are some. Well, in verse fourteen, he said, "One of the good things that I've noticed about my imprisonment, uh, far more courage has has come to speak the word of God without fear." Uh, the problem the problem that Paul was having that some were turning that freedom of speech, which is a good thing, turned it against Paul. Uh, uh, and uh, he describes it in verse 15, some to be sure are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambitious ambition rather than pure motives, thinking to cause me more distress in my imprisonment. And he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or, or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. I mean, he, he took the high ground, didn't he? What we could say, he took the high ground. And uh, that's probably the best ground to be on because that's where the Lord is. So, and so I found, I found Paul's response to that uh, really interesting. And I thought it was interesting that he didn't, um, he didn't, he, he, he tr he's still trying to peace, he's trying to make, he's trying to bring healing for the church, it, it, not division. Even though there, there is some division going on theologically, he still says the church is still the greatest thing on earth. And we need to be pro proactive in the midst of that. Uh, and he boils it down. Listen, there's a lot we could be critical or pro, pro but look, for me, I rejoice in that Christ is being proclaimed. In other words, the message, the message, see, they, both sides had the message right and the method, the, what I call mechanics wrong. They were preaching Christ came into the world to die for our sins was buried and raised from the dead. They were both, both, there was no dispute that. But how to be saved was the dispute that the law entered in at that point. Well, the work of Christ isn't sufficient in itself. And, and that was the argument. It is because of grace. Grace offers us a gift and gift takes away all this exercise of what do I have to do to be saved? Well, I have to believe that Christ is sufficient, that his one death is enough death to secure me until my death. And so that we still fight that war. We still fight the law. You would think after all these years in Christianity, uh, just nutrition, just the fact that we're still here would be enough, but it isn't. It's a, and, and that's because the, the devil is a great opponent the greatest opponent that we'll ever face is, is the devil. And, and he's here for the haul, as we say. He's in for the long run. We, when the devil's involved, we call it the cosmos diabolica system. The two Greek words, the, the word cosmos is the word for world, and diabolicus is the word for the devil. And when you put these two things together, you have a system in the world that is run by the devil as well as a system in the world that's run by God. So these are in opposition one to another. And you see it in the very book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. It's just, it's just not in America. <laughs> it's, it was in the Garden of Eden uh, in the attack upon Eve. I want to show you something out of Revelation. We just completed a study out of the book of Revelation. Um, on the great, on the tribulation, the seven years of tribulation, we, we completed that study. And there was one part of that study that uh, I wanted to bring back to you as an introduction uh, of a, the warfare in heaven that's on earth. In verse 7, and there was a war in heaven. In eternity past, there was a war in heaven. And Michael, an archangel, and his angels waging war with the dragon... That is the person that led Eve. Let me hold my place there and show you it. Who's this dragon? Well, it's a code word. Sure it is. 
But if you go to Revelation, the 20th chapter, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the keys of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon. That would be the Lord. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. That's the guy. That's the guy we're talking about. Just to get an idea. See that dragon in, in Revelation 12, 7, that word waging war against the dragon. Michael versus the dragon, who is Satan. The dragon and his angels waged war. See, now, look, at here, here, here's the point that I want to show you. That war, that war that was in heaven in eternity past is now on earth. It's been on earth since, since uh, Genesis 1. Since the creation of the world, that warfare is now here. He, Satan was cast out, and he's here. The, and we call, we call this here angelic conflict. This is the angelic warfare that's now on earth, and we're engaged in it. Do you know that? See, there was a war in heaven, right? Michael versus Satan, right? That war is on earth now. It, it's talked about in Revelation, the 12th chapter, the tribute. Listen, the whole tribulation is bringing this warfare to a completion. That's the tribulation. That war is going to come to a completion. He's going to be get, he's going to get beat. And he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. That warfare is on earth, and the warfare is about humanity, hu human life. Let me show you the warfare. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians. Let me show you the warfare that's in your front yard. This is front yard theology here. Ephesians, you know this now, it's in the 6th chapter, verse 10. Then I'm going to come back to Revelation 12. I want to show you that this war that was in eternity past, that was involved in the Garden of Eden, has now spread out as all over the world. And... If you're a Christian, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, if you believe that for your salvation, you're involved in that warfare. You're involved in this warfare. Now watch this. I mean, Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might, so that you might put on the full armor of God to be able to stand firm against the scheme of the devil. You see, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, human, human, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's, that's the angelic conflict. That's Satan's army in description. Therefore, knowing this, therefore, as a result of knowing all this, take up the full armor of God and he's going to describe it in a minute, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Now, before I get to the armor, you see, we're in a warfare. Do you realize we're in a warfare? And this is the warfare now that was in eternity past is now on earth. And listen, the devil is fighting for his life. In the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter, we're in the great, we're in the tribulation. And he's in the fight for his life. Because, see, he knows what y you don't know or don't believe. He knows that the end is coming for him. He's in the last chapter of his life. Yeah. Now, in verse 14 of the Ephesians 6, Stand firm, therefore. Stand firm, therefore, because we're in an angelic conflict up to our eyeballs. Having gird your loins with truth, that's one piece of armor, Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, that's the second piece of armor. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that's third. In addition, all, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith, which will be able to distinguish all the fiery arrows of the evil one. 
And here's the, fi- the final two. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That is the, fu- that's how, you- we're in a war. This is how you, this is the equipment you need to fight it successfully. And this war is going to rage from the Garden of Eden all the way to the, all the way to the time of the new heaven and new earth. And that's going to be, and then he's done in. He's going to be done. The tribulation is all about doing him in. That's what that's about. We just studied it. So I'm back to Revelation, the 12th chapter. This war that was in eternity past is now on the earth. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon and his angels. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. That is, Michael, uh, uh, the dragon and his angels. That's, we call them fallen angels. And the great dragon was thrown down. That's earth. The serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And you see, they're in a fight for their life. This is the last big hurrah and war. And it's going to be, it's going to wind up in a battle called Armageddon. And that's going to be the end of it. And he's going to be cast into the lake of fire and his angels. And so then I heard a voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren have been thrown down, he who accuses them before God day and night. Watch verse 11, because here's our victory. Here's our victory. And, and for this reason, reju- let's see, and they overcame, verse 11, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their, their life even when faced with death. And that's the martyrs of the tribulation. All the martyring of the tribulation, those who didn't get the mark of the beast were martyred. The great many of them. So, you see, Paul worries about the fact that the Anjac conflict got inside the church as doing war against one another inside the church. See, see that? The angelic conflict is normally outside the church, has gotten inside the church. And they're, they're battling, they're battling uh, works versus grace. If you know anything about Paul's teaching, you know this. I mean, you read his writings. He was in the fight of his life inside the church, inside Christianity. And, and we're in that. We, we cannot allow that warfare on the outside get inside. Let me let me let me show you one other scripture. All right, I'm gonna go to Second Corinthians 11, chapter 14. Show you something. Well, you gotta have your spiritual eyes on in the church. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verse 14. It's a powerful scripture. And Paul knows this really well because he's been experiencing this. I mean, he's, this is who he's been battling. He's been battling the devil. He's been battling the devil his entire uh, salvation career. Uh, in the 11th chapter, verse 14, he talks about in verse 13, false apostles who have gotten in the church. False apostles, deceiver workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. See, that's verse 13. Verse 14, no wonder for even, watch this now, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Isn't that something? I mean, this guy is an angel of darkness, 
and disguises himself as an angel of light. The problem is he can't pass, he cannot pass the light on to anybody. Look, the truth of the matter is he's disguised as an angel of light. The truth of the matter is he's an angel of darkness. Therefore, he can only pass on darkness. He can't, per, per, he can't per, pass on the light. If he passes anything onto it, it's the darkness. It's dark. He, he's, he has no light. He disguises himself that way. In, in reality of truth, he's not that way, right? Well, I've got to tell you the way it is. Now listen to me, you and I, because of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, are children of light. Jesus is the light to the world, agreed? He's a light, he's the light of the world. He is the light of the world to the world. When you get saved, you have that light of God in you in the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we are the light of Christ in the world. Listen to me. And we can pass that on. We pass that light on to someone else. We lead another person to Christ to say that Christ came and died for their sin, was buried and raised from the dead, and that person believed that, that light's put in them. We are able, as a children of light, to pass on the light. The devil can't do that. He can only pass on darkness. Can't, he can't produce the light of God. We can pass on the light of God. Do you understand how you do that? You bring them to the gospel, and the gospel brings them to the light. The devil can't listen. You always can tell the devil because he can't pass on the light. He's he's in truth of reality. He's darkness. He thinks darkness. He lives darkness. He is darkness. He's an angel of darkness who disguises himself, and he's got all kinds of different people in the church passing on darkness. They 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 they, they talk unrighteousness and teach unrighteousness. I just read that to you. So, you've really got to know who you're fighting. You know, listen, listen the, he makes it clear. The one group you're not fighting is flesh and blood. If you're fighting people, you're fighting the wrong war. You understand that? If you're spending all of your energy, all of your mind, all of your money on fighting people, you're fighting the wrong war. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 says, our warfare is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers, wickedness and, and, dark, and the dark places. You'll never be successful. You'll never be a victor if you don't understand how to fight the fight, how you fight it. You'll always be a victim. Get out of that victim's mentality. You'll always be a victim. Oh, well, you don't understand, Pastor. I don't, look. You live in the power of the Holy Spirit and the light of God. Get out of darkness. Stop going to dark places to live dark lives. Be the light of Christ, people. Be the light of Christ. Go back to your high school and junior high and colleges and be light for Christ. So let me close out my lesson today. Let me close out my lesson. Paul has been in, under house arrest in Rome. And it was a good thing because it offered him opportunities in Rome where he was supposed to have gone, if you remember, and didn't. Remember? The call of Macedonia said, go west. He was supposed to be in Rome and didn't go to Rome. He went east and got in trouble. The Lord put his thumb on him, like he did with Jonah. Like he does with you and me. I mean, he's not... He, 
He don't mind putting a thumb on you and go like, wait, where are you going? Why are you going? Why are you doing that way? Why are you thinking that way? It gets your attention. He has ways of getting your attention. And you ought to take it as a positive, not a negative. And so, so Paul winds up in Rome. And, 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 and listen, God, because he's back into fellowship with the Lord, the Lord has made his life in Rome very comfortable, has he not? He's under house arrest. He's living. He's he's in rental quarters, which a little church of Philippi is glad to put glad to pay the bail for it. And people are able to come and go. He's he's holding Bible studies. He, he, he's impacted the Praetorian Guard, the elite military of the Roman Empire, and Caesar's household staff that come and wait on him. With it as a prisoner status. He's a prisoner status, but he has Roman privileges because he hasn't been charged with anything yet, so they can only hold him, and they hold him with nobility. Isn't that interesting? Now he's in prison because he can't go anywhere out of the house. But God in his marvelous grace has done a lot of wonderful things with Paul since Paul went east and not west. A prison ship put him into Rome, and Rome put him in a rental house. I mean, how good is God, people? How good is God? Why would you ever give up on God? Why would you ever give up on God when he's about to give you the big stuff? You, you, you peel off and go crazy. So Paul is, Paul is having an impact in Rome. Before arriving to Rome, Paul had defended the grace gospel by apologetic debating before the Jewish court and the Roman court overseas. In other words, when he was in the east, he went before Jewish courts and he went before Roman courts, and you can read about it from Acts 21 to Acts 28, and used apologetic debating, and he won his cases. Then he appealed to Rome because he, they couldn't, when, they, when he beat them in court, they chose to kill him. They, listen, they, not only, look, not only did they threaten to kill him, they actually put money out and had hit men try to get him. You should read that story. That's great reading. You should read, of course, it's not your life, and so, you know, they put hit, they put a contract out on his life. If somebody will go in and kill this guy, we'll make you make you a hero. And uh, they couldn't get him because God intervened. It, they, it's just a wonderful read. It should, it's a wonderful read. I put it on your paper as a group. It won't take you any time to read 21 through 26. Hey, come on, people. In Acts 21 through 26, Paul has defended the grace gospel under uh, under apologetic debating techniques so well that one of the judges, one of the judges that he pulled before, a guy called Agrippa out of the Jewish court system, here's what he said to Paul when Paul got through with his argument, his argument. This man said, in a short time, Paul, you will persuade me to become a Christian. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? What did Paul do? He defended the gospel and he gave a clear understanding of it, told them exactly what they had to do to be saved. And Agrippa says, you know what? I'm almost ready to do that. But they'd probably kill me if I did. <laughs> I represent a group of people who are trying to kill you. Uh, I thought that was a pretty strong argument that one of the top people running the whole show against Paul almost was convinced when he heard his, heard his defense, almost became a Christian. I, and, and God, wonderful. Let me close with this. Uh, Acts 28, 28. Paul's final message delivered to the priest nation of Israel. The, if you read Romans 11, 9 through 11, you will see Paul's heart for Israel. You will read about Paul's heart for Israel. Sometimes it got him in trouble. 
Sometimes he got him in trouble with him. But his heart for him. And he finally brings his final message to the nation. He gave a national address to the priest nation of Israel in Acts 28, 28. This is part of it. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles because they will listen. Isn't that terrible? What an indictment. And here's a man who loved his nation at great risk to himself. And they just would not listen. And he says, so for me, I said goodbye to a nation I love. I say goodbye to the priest nation of Israel because only bad days are ahead for you. But I go to the Gentiles. And the Lord put the thumb on it. He said, I'm going to the Gentiles. They ain't coming back. So here's my final statement to you. Here's my final statement to you. So let's pray. We'll pray and then, uh, pray and then do our pledge. I'm going to ask Gary Horton, if you would, Gary, uh, Close us in this prayer, if you would. Father, we thank you for the encouragement we receive by standing for the great God. Mm. It's not by works, that anyone brag. Thank you for your amazing grace yes. mm. and your faithfulness to us. Let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works, but instead glorify you. Yes. Thank you for Ron's ministry. Thank you for Jackie uh, Mission Field right now, reaching those people. Thank you for Rick's ministry to Africa and the prospect AIDS, that area. Thank you for the Myers in such a conflict. We thank you, Father, for a church that cares enough to stand for the truth. Bless our youth and bless our older kids. Thank you for your marvelous mercy and grace. And let us continue to walk by faith in that grace. Mm. Thank you.